Sorry guys, we're having some uh, connection issues on Instagram right now. Just give a second here. Sorry guys, we're just having some major issues with Instagram right now. We're just trying to get it working. So we're getting some word from some people that it seems like Instagram's having issues right now. So we it might be an Instagram issue right now. Gonna try one more thing on Instagram here, guys. Hang on a second. Yep. Same thing? Nope. Yep. Okay. It's not great quality. It's okay. Take it out of the case and sit it on here. Hey guys, sorry about the uh, technical challenges with our Instagram Live, but we, I think, are up and going now. Um, Facebook's working, and hopefully uh, Instagram, we don't lose the connection again. So welcome. Uh, this is, I think, series uh, six now. Um, tonight, I'm really excited because we are going to be tasting our, uh, our recently released and bottled Omerica Rosé. Um, before we get into uh, tonight's discussion... Now, I'm going to give you guys a pretty good, thorough uh, overview of how rosés are made. So it'll get a little bit technical, but it's really interesting if you guys are into rosé wine or, or any wines at all. So, uh, so stick around for that. Um, and before we start the tasting, I thought I, we always get questions about what's going on in the vineyard. So I'm going to start with just a few uh, quick updates as to what we're doing. We have uh, completed all of our sort of 
prep style work, which is uh, the pruning, the tying of the canes. Uh, we got our mulching done, so all the things that we cut off the vines, we actually grind back up and leave on the floor of the vineyard. That work's all done, which is great. Last night, we uh, unfortunately had to spend about four hours outside in the, in the darkness with uh, headlamps and flashlights, walking up and down the rows and looking closely at every one of our vines, uh, trying to look for cutworms. So cutworms are a bit of a challenge around these parts. Um, they, they, crawl, they, they spend their days down the grass on the floor of the, uh, of the vineyard, and then at night time, they crawl up. They go out onto the cordons, and what they do is they, they eat the, uh, the buds that are now swelling up or just about to break. They eat those buds and uh, essentially kill the bud. So if we let the cutworms kind of feast as they want, um, it really uh, hampers how much uh, fruit we grow. So it's definitely time well spent, uh, you know, a few nights in, in the early spring here, getting, uh, getting as many of those cutworms off of the, uh, the vines as we can. Uh, on a positive note though, while we were out last night, uh, we noticed that one of the vines, one of the buds in our north block of Merlot has, uh, has gone through bud break. And bud break is essentially where the, the, the buds, which contain all of the, the, the precursors for what will form shoots, uh, leaves, and clusters, um, those burst through uh, and you can start to see the formations of little flowers. So it's a really, really exciting time in the vineyard. We're, uh, we're excited to have uh, the whole vineyard go through that process, but uh, bud breaks always a pretty uh, monumental event um, in, uh, in the, the wine growing world. So uh, that is now uh, in, uh, in play. Uh, the last task we're going to work on in the vineyard is uh, spreading compost. So we, uh, we just had a truckload of organic compost uh, delivered today, and we're gonna go and spread that around the base of the vines just to add some more nutrients and uh, sort of freshen up uh, some of the uh, soil nutrients for the, for the vines. And that is uh, our update on the vineyard. I'll have more to tell you guys next week as uh, I'm sure seven days from now we'll have a lot more uh, growth going on on the vines. All right, rosé. Uh, for those of you who, who have been drinking rosé for a while, um, I don't need to get you on the bandwagon. On the bandwagon. It's, a, it's a fantastic wine for so many different reasons. Um, uh, I've, uh, I've been um, drinking rosés for 20 years and uh, I'm always just blown away by their versatility. So if you're, if you're a food person, rosés are, are one of the best wines for, for pairing with foods. Uh, they're great to sip on their own um, and it's not just a summer wine. Um, I think uh, some, there, there's definitely a lot more marketing around uh, rosés and their appeal for the summer, which is absolutely true. Uh, I love to sit on the patio and have a glass of rosé. Um, but there are many rosés, particularly the styles that have a little bit more depth and body to them. Um, they really are four season wines, so don't ever shy away from drinking a glass of rosé in the winter. Okay, how is rosé made? Uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, I'm going to take you through the three primary methods of making rosé. There's the blend method, uh, the sanier method, and the maceration or direct press method. Um, and I've got some little rudimentary uh, uh, experiments here to show you how these things are made. So we'll start with the blend method. Uh, this is the simplest way to make rosé. Uh, it's generally not done in your higher end rosé wines. Uh, you'll, you'll find lots of those uh, cheap and cheerful blends from California, rosés or blushes that are done in this style. And simply you take white wine, you take a little bit of red wine, you mix them together, Voila, you have a rosé. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, it's just not, uh, it's not kind of a, it's not a lot of, uh, of uh, wine making and wine growing effort that goes into making that style of rosé. Uh, next, we have what's called the Sanier method. Uh, now, Sanier is a French word which means to bleed. And how this method is, is accomplished is, um, when the red grapes are harvested uh, for making a red wine, um, often you'll, you'll crush and destem those, those grapes and then let them sit together because the red wines, if you guys know this, red wines ferment with the skins and the seeds. Um, and the juice of a grape is actually clear. 
uh, all the color compounds, the anthocyanins, are in the skins. And so when you allow the, the crushed grapes and the juice that comes out, that clear juice, uh, when you allow that to sit on the skins, the, the pigments uh, come out of the skins and start to color the, the juice. Um, now, normally with a Sanye method, what they're doing is they're actually trying to make a better red wine, a more concentrated red wine, by pulling off some of that, uh, that juice um, relatively quickly after the grapes have been crushed. Um, and so what I've done here is I'm, I'm just using table grapes because there's, there's obviously no fresh uh, wine grapes available right now. Um, but about uh, two hours ago, I took a handful of uh, red table grapes and uh, squished them all up and let them sit on their skins here. I'm trying not to make too much of a mess. But as I pour off some of this juice, uh, you can clearly see that it's pink. Um, so that is what happens in the Sanye method. So as I said before, what they're trying to do is to actually make a better red wine and the, the Sanye Rosé is, uh, well I guess it's a byproduct of that process. So um, that doesn't mean it's not a good wine. Some of the best rosés are Sanye style. Um, it just, it's a fundamentally different approach to, to making a rosé. And then finally, I'm going to show you uh, the maceration method, or what I, I call the direct press method. Um, and so, again, what I've done here is I've, I've taken those same grapes and I've squeezed them um, without letting the skin sit on the juice. And so I've got just some regular red table grapes here. And when you squeeze these, you'll see that juice that comes out is, uh, is clear. It's got a little bit of a yellow color, but that's all, even green grapes have that color. Um, and so what you're left with is essentially a clear wine. So when you're doing a, a direct press method, um, you can do as little or, or as much skin contact as, as the winemaker desires. Um, it's generally the style of rosé that's made in, in, uh, in Provence, which is sort of the world's uh, mecca for, for rosé wines. Um, and so when you're doing that style, uh, your, your, your destination wine is a rosé. You're not making a better red wine by taking some juice out. You're actually purposely intending to make a rosé. Um, and there's a big difference between uh, that as your winemaking style versus the Sagné because all the decisions that you make throughout the growing season in the vineyard and early on in the winery are focused on making a rosé wine, not on making a really good red wine with a bit of a byproduct. Um, so some of those decisions, just to give you a couple examples, would be you know, how, how you manage the, the, the crop of the grapes throughout the growing season. Uh, in many cases, you're going to be harvesting grapes for a, sanye, or for, sorry, for a, a direct press method uh, earlier um, to capture freshness, to capture acidity, to get lower pH, to get um, sort of brighter citrus notes. Um, whereas if you're, if you're making a red wine, you're going to let those grapes ripen uh, to, the step, to the point that you need for, for that really good red wine. So uh, a couple, I mean, there's, every wine is different, but some general differences between the Sagné method and the direct press method would be looking at things like uh, like color. Generally, you probably have a little bit more color in a Sagné style. Um, and then the body and the alcohol, those sort of components um, are gonna be generally fuller body, higher alcohol in your Sagné method than they would be in direct press if you're harvesting for your direct press method a bit earlier. Um, so again, th those, are, those are a couple of the key differences. Uh, both of those styles uh, make fantastic rosé wines. Um, our Omerta is done, as I said, in the direct press method, um, and we, we, we make lots of decisions throughout the year that are specifically focused on making this wine, uh, although the fruit comes from the same vineyard. Um, we harvest our Syrah for Omerta. Uh, 2019 was uh, October 10th, that was the Syrah harvest date. Um, and then for the red wine, we let the grapes hang for almost uh, well, it's about 10 more days. The 20th was when we harvested for the red wine. So um, what we're trying to do there was to actually let the, the grapes fully ripen, develop more flavors, more colors, more alcohol, more sugar. 
um, that we were looking for in the red wine. Um, but for the style of, uh, of, Omer of Omerta, it's that fresh, crisp, uh, dry style that um, requires sort of uh, an earlier harvest date. Um, <clears throat> once the grapes come into the winery, um, we, uh, we do a whole cluster press for our Syrah Rosé. And so that means the grapes come in from the vineyard, they're still attached to their bunches, uh, we don't destem them, we don't crush them, they go straight into the press as the whole clusters. We sort them before they go in to pull out uh, any, any cr uh, clusters that may not be in the best condition. Um, but uh, we do whole cluster pressing and we do a really long and gentle press cycle. Uh, it lasts about four hours. Um, and just to give you some comparisons, our, our, a normal red wine press cycle or a white wine press cycle would be about two, two and a half hours. So what we do is we actually uh, uh, sort of draw out that process a little bit, squeezing a little more gently, um, but uh, extending that time a bit. So that's where uh, this color comes from, which is you know a fairly pale pink. Um, four hours of skin contact. Once the grapes uh, have been pressed and the juice comes out, um, we we actually do two separate. Uh, we fill two separate tanks. Um, if you ever heard the expression free run or uh, press wine or hard press, um, what we're doing in that case is we're actually separating the free run juice. And so that's the, the, the bulk of the juice that comes out from the berries before we really start to squeeze hard on the press cycle. That free run juice when it goes in a separate tank and it's very, very pale in color. Uh, once we start the, the really hard press cycle where we're squeezing quite hard through the, through the press, we, uh, we put that into a separate tank, which is obviously much smaller because your fraction is quite a bit smaller. Um, and from that component, you get much more richness in terms of color, in terms of phenol components, so even some tannins, that sort of stuff. We, we, but we like to keep those separate because uh, if, you, if you mix them all together at once, you've really sort of set your path and, and you've defined that style from, from the, the very first instant that you started making the, the wine. By separating them, uh, we're able then to, to blend uh, components of that hard press into the free run uh, if, if the, the style requires it, which is actually what we did. So once, uh, once the press was done, all the juice is out, uh, we went through a six day process called stabulation. Uh, if you've never heard of this term, don't, I'm not surprised. It's, uh, it's, it's just a process that um, is a little bit different uh, for, for wine making. Um, normally when you, when you make a white wine, um, or, or rosé in some cases, you, you press and you get your juice, you let that juice settle in a tank uh, for anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, and all the suspended solids, so the, the, the bits of pulp and things like that, will settle to the bottom of the tank, and then you rack the clear juice off of what's called gross leaves. And so that's all the stuff that, that sort of settles out of that, uh, that pressed wine. Uh, and then you go on to, to do your fermentations with that racked wine. Um, with uh, the stabulation process, we actually don't do that at all. We, we let the, the gross leaves sit in that wine for, in our case, six days, and we stir it twice a day to resuspend that gross leaves uh, and the whole, the whole thought behind that is to, is to extract more of those flavor and aroma precursors that are in those components, the skins and the seeds. All those things carry character uh, that we didn't necessarily want to cast off after the first day of winemaking. So we actually resystem that by stirring that twice a day. Uh, and then each day I would look at the color of our free run wine. Um, which is where we were doing the stabulation, and then add in a little bit of that hard press wine to get a bit more color. And after the third day, uh, I'd achieved the color that I was looking for, which is what's in the bottle essentially. Um, and then we uh, continue to, uh, to make that, um, that wine. Our fermentation was all done in stainless steel tanks, so none of this wine sees any oak. Um, and then we uh, bottled it at the end of March. So it's uh, about uh, three, almost four weeks ago. Um, yeah, so that's how we make the wine. Uh, if you have any questions on that process, please fire away uh, when we get to our Q&A period at the end or send me, uh, send me a message or an email. Uh, I love talking about rosé. It's, it's one of my favorite wines to make. So um, 
lots of uh, lots of things to talk about if you guys want to dig in a little bit deeper. So let's get into the tasting part, which is I'm sure why most of you guys are here. <clears throat> um, so you'll see if uh, if you have this wine and you get it into your glass, uh, it's a nice pale pink color. So I get this a little bit closer for you. Um, and it's it's hue, it's, it's brilliantly clear. It's got a sparkle to it almost so when you when you see the light through it. Um, when you smell this wine, it's it's just so vibrant. Uh, the the aromas are jumping out of the glass here, and it's uh, it's really 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 pungent. Um, when you want to, when you are looking for for fruit components here, definitely lots of red berries, wild strawberries, uh, red cherries. Those are definitely the dominant fruits here. Uh, there, there's a citrus component to it. Um, and a, a little bit of melon too, I'd say. And now let's give us a taste. All right, so this is a dry style rosé. I've already mentioned that. Um, it's super crisp, great acid. Uh, it's got a, a really clean, mineral-driven uh, feel in your mouth. Um, very fresh. Uh, from a flavor perspective, it's, it's the same things that we were smelling. So definitely the wild strawberries. Um, cherries are jumping out of the glass. Uh, I'd say the, the citrus is probably a bit more to the lime side rather than lemon. Um, and I, I would say there's still a little bit of hint of pepper here. And again, that's characteristic of, of the Syrah grape, which is uh, um, way more prevalent when you're tasting a red Syrah with that, that really strong white pepper note. But there's definitely some pepper component to this, uh, although it's, it's mild and, and quite pleasing. Yeah, and then the melon, I'd say, is like a watermelon, actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of some of the specs for this wine, um, it's, uh, it's got about 12 12.5, 12.6% alcohol. Uh, the acid is about 6.6 .6 grams per liter. And, uh, and the sugar, the residual sugar, is less than 2. I think it's about 1.5 or 1.6 grams per liter. So um, what does all that mean? Uh, well, if you think back to how we talked about the different styles of rosé, um, we're seeing a, a, a lighter alcohol expression in this wine because we picked those grapes almost two weeks ahead of we of when we picked the Syrah for the red wine. Um, and the, the, the dryness is coming, um, the crispness is coming from the, the state of those grapes when we pick them. So you're having slightly elevated levels of acid and lower levels of, of sugar. Um, and that's what's driving the, the alcohol and the acidness. So it's... Uh, it's a very, very crisp and clean rosé. Um, fruit pairings. Uh, I, I alluded to this at the, at the intro here, that rosé is, is truly a ubiquitous wine when it comes to food. Um, there really isn't much that it doesn't go with. Uh, obviously, the different styles of rosé that are out there would lend themselves more to certain types of food. If you've got a fuller-bodied Sanye style, uh, it can definitely weather um, richer, uh, meatier foods. Um, for a, a lighter expression, um, again, you've got lots of delicate things that, uh, that you can pair with. Uh, for Aromerta, I would say um, it's, it's fresh, clean, dry style is definitely a, a good match for fish, grilled fish of any sort. Um, I would say from a cheese perspective, uh, probably like a medium aged cheese, like a Gruyere or a, of a, like a cave aged Gruyere that's got a little bit of character to it, but um, not overly pungent. Um, and then uh, the recipe that we'll post on, on our website for, for the actual pairing for this, we did uh, tried a couple of weeks ago and it was a sous vide um, pork tenderloin that we finished with um, a maple glaze and uh, an apple reduction. Um, what we use is, uh, is Maple Rock. It's a, a local syrup uh, producer here in Summerland. Um, and he actually uh, taps maple trees here in Summerland and makes the syrup here. It's actually quite spectacular. Um, so we made a reduction out of some freshly made syrup this year. Uh, really good pairing with the, with the Omerta. Um, the, the pork, when you cook it that way, it's quite delicate in flavor, um, and so it, uh, it it definitely elevates the wine. It doesn't really uh, it doesn't bury it. So that's a really good recipe, and we'll make sure that we get that posted online for everybody to have a look at. Um, 
Are there any questions? Lots of questions. Lots of questions. Okay, good. Lots of comments. A lot of uh, people commenting on the flavor of the wines. Very tasty. Strawberries. Uh, one question that came in from Karen: What is the best varietal to use for a rosé? Uh, I don't think there's a single answer for that. Um, there's definitely some more common or more prevalent varietals. Um, you know, when I think about rosés made here in the Okanagan, uh, Pinot Noir definitely comes to, to mind. Some of the, I think some of the best rosés from the valley here come from that varietal. Um, it's, a, it's a thinner skin variety that makes very delicate, very pretty wines. Um, Another one would be uh, Cabernet Franc. There's some spectacular uh, rosés made from that grape. Again, uh, more on that lighter style. Uh, one of my favorite, I mean, I, I love Syrahs. It's one of my favorite wines for, for uh, grapes for rosé. Um, but another standout for me would be uh, Grenache. Um, the challenge is there's just not a lot of Grenache grown in the valley here, um, but it makes a, a really juicy style uh, expression of uh, rosé. So I'd say uh, those are probably three of the most common that you would see in, from other places in, in the world, uh, Pinot Noir, Cap Franc, and uh, Grenache. Okay, you're getting lots of comments. Uh, people are pairing it with spaghetti and meatballs. They're pairing it with uh, thin crust veggie pizza. Absolutely. Like I said, there really isn't much that, uh, that Rosé doesn't go with. Uh, next question. Uh, someone wants to know, uh, a couple people are actually asking uh, about your t-shirt and if it's available. To oh, um, we, uh, we don't have them available yet. Uh, we are in the process of uh, getting a whole bunch of uh, branded merchandise uh, ordered up. Uh, we're looking at, you know, corkscrews and hats and t-shirts and that sort of stuff. So um, we had originally intended to time that with the opening of our tasting room, which is sort of still up in the air, thanks to COVID. Um, but uh, we were talking and I think uh, we probably won't wait for the tasting to open. We'll get some merch and get it up on the website. And then uh, if people are interested, they can order it from, uh, from our online store. How do you test for sugar levels in grapes before harvest? Uh, we use, well, there's uh, basically, it's, it's called a refractometer. Um, and there's, there's analog and digital versions of those, but essentially what you're, you're, you're using, uh, light and a prism to, 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 um, gauge how much, uh, of that light is refracted away by suspended solids. And those suspended solids, uh, are essentially sugar. So the higher the bricks level, um, the higher the, the sugar level in the grape itself. Um, we harvested the Syrah for the Rosé at about 22 bricks. Um, and when we waited uh, about 10 days later for um, the red wine, it was at uh, close to 24 bricks. So um, you definitely see a, a, a ramped up accumulation or rate of accumulation as, uh, as the harvest goes on. Um, and again, that, that's key to the, those, those ripeness differences are key to the styles of the, the wines you make. Uh, well, how do you decide when to release your rosé? What's a good indicator for you as a winemaker? Uh, rosés are, our style of rosé is generally ready to go um, right early in the new year. Um, our release date is, is often driven by logistics. So it's um, getting bottles or getting the, the capsules, the caps, um, uh, arranging for the bottling facility, all that stuff. So um, for the rosé, we definitely want to have it out in early in the spring so that uh, we can capture sort of that, uh, that, that patio season mentality that uh, everyone thinks of rosé with. Um, but generally, it's, uh, it's a wine that's ready quite early after, after producing. Will this wine change with age? Uh, it will. Um, so there's a there's a few things that will happen over time. So the and, and this isn't necessarily specific to rosé, um, but you will definitely see this with with our wine. Um, you'll lose a little bit of that brilliant color. The 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 wine will become a bit richer, um, a bit darker, um, and then from a tasting perspective, uh, that vibrancy might tend to wane a little bit, and you might pull out some richer flavors, uh, maybe some more savory flavors. 
Um, those are generally uh, what happens to wines as they as they age. Um, but this is definitely a style that is really enjoyed fresh and young. Um, and I, I wouldn't really recommend having a, a rosé age much more than two or three years for, for the style of, of rosé I've had made. Um, was it difficult to use Syrah considering how great of a red wine it is? Uh, yes. Um, and the reason actually, uh, so we've, this is the third vintage of, of Omer that we've made. Um, and it's the first time I've been able to use Syrah and I've always wanted to use Syrah, but we purchased our Syrah from a, from a grower in the Soyuz and, uh, it's, it tends to be one of the more expensive varietals that, uh, that we work with. Um, and so it makes it a bit challenging when you're, when you're using a really expensive input, um, that ends up in a bottle that's essentially priced like a white wine. Um, there's some economic challenges that go along to uh, uh, that go along with that. Um, but uh, we got a new contract with our grower last year, a multi-year contract that we're really excited about because we'll be working with these people for for an even longer period, and uh, that came with some pretty good uh, pricing terms. So. Um, last year was the first year that I was able to make it with Syrah and uh, I, will intend, I will intend to continue doing that for the foreseeable future. How did you come up with the name for the rosé? Um, so o Omerta, uh, it, it means uh, a vow of silence. Um, there's a, a pretty funny story if you were to Google it. Um, it's uh, the history of that word is um, that it was a word used by criminals that would, would never rat out their worst enemy, um, no matter what. So uh, for us, it was all about um, uh, just not really disclosing a whole lot about it. We don't say really anything about this wine on the bottle other than its name is Syrah. That's kind of our vow of silence. Uh, we don't want to, um, to have people um, presuppose anything about the wine before they actually open it up and try it and judge it for themselves. How many cases of rosé did you make this year? 110. Everyone seems to use clear bottles for rosé. Is there any implication for rosés because of this? Uh, no, I mean, the, the, I, would, I would say the reason people do is, is to show off the color. Like it really is a pretty wine. Um, but as with any wine that's bottled in a clear, clear bottle, uh, you want to keep it out of direct sunlight. Um, any wine that's subject to direct sunlight uh, is definitely uh, subject to degradation. Um, so if you're if you're storing a bottle of this wine, please don't leave it on your kitchen counter in front of your window. Um, it definitely doesn't belong there. Does weather play a part when you're making your rosé from year to year? Uh, absolutely. If weather plays a part in all of the wines we make. Um, but perhaps a little bit more influential on, on our rosé because we do different things throughout the season uh, in terms of how, how the Syrah is farmed. Um, we carry a slightly heavier uh, crop load for the grapes we're using for the rosé um, because we don't want uh, a lot of accumulation of sugar because we're not trying to have a high alcohol wine in this case. Um, and so uh, if, you're, if you're carrying a bigger crop um, you need a bigger canopy to support that uh, development um, and a bigger canopy brings lots of potential challenges around the, the microclimate inside the canopy um, you know the, the denser your canopy is the more chance you have for uh, humid conditions that that help with um, things like botrytis bunch rot with powdery mildew so it's a whole series of, of challenges that come along with that um, but at the end of the day, I think it's, uh, it's, it's worth that risk. Uh, question slash comment. We just realized we're drinking the 18. How does this compare to the 19? And guess we're opening another bottle. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad you, I'm glad that question came through because, uh, it's, it, it'll be great when you actually are able to taste the 19. So take some notes of what you're drinking from, from the 18. Um, so our 18 was made with Merlot, uh, grown at our estate vineyard here in, uh, in Caledon. Um, and again, the, the, the style of that wine and the, the intention from the outset was the same. So we have two blocks of Merlot here at Conviction Ridge, a uh, north block and a south block. And we reserve the south block uh, for the rosé. Um, so we, we made different decisions when we pruned about how much uh, yield we wanted to achieve. 
Uh, we manage the canopy differently, all sorts of things. So the exact same process we went through for, for the straw we did with the, with the Merlot. Um, uh, but at harvest time in 2018, um, there was a fairly rapid accumulation of, of, uh, of sugar in a very short period of time. We had a fairly cool and wet uh, September. Um, and then once the sun came out, it only took a couple days for, for the, the ripeness to really sort of uh, catch on. So um, our Merlot ended up being a little fuller body than, than maybe I would have uh, chosen had I, uh, for, or at least from the outset. Um, and, but with that brought some really cool character. Uh, that that rosé in particular, um, although it's a fairly pale color, it's, uh, it's a symphony of, of undertones going on in that wine. Um, it's, there's a richness and there's depth and layers. It's a really, really complex wine um, that is definitely one of those winter rosés for sure. How many cases of rosé are left? Uh, probably down to what, 70? Um, it's, it's been kind of flying off the shelves for the last, uh, last few weeks. Um, yeah, which is great because we want people to be drinking us as, uh, as spring hits and the, the weather warms up. As a winemaker, do you like Botrytis? Uh, it's a tough one. Um, if you're if you're making a Botrytis affected wine, um, you need it. Uh, that's for sure. And so Botrytis is it's it's a rot that sets in in the clusters themselves, um, and it, it has a it has a drying or a desiccating effect on the berries. Um, and so what that does is it, it concentrates the sugar in that grape over uh, 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 less volume of water. Um, and, uh, and botrytis in particular adds a really nuanced flavor that uh, is, is pretty spectacular. Um, there are some, some white wines in particular that uh, carry a really small component of that, which, uh, which I think is actually quite appealing. Uh, I'm not sure everyone would agree with that, but uh, if you know what you're looking for and, and, and you realize that it's not a fault, it's actually there by design, um, it, it brings a pretty cool effect to the wine. There was one other question that had come in earlier about the Pinot Noir, so I saved that for the end, given that it's coming up next week. Uh, they had wanted to open up a bottle of Pinot Noir the other night, but were struggling with the wax top. Ah. Okay, so our Pinot Noir, uh, we just put the medallion on the top here. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, when I did our Syrah tasting, you can go back and have a look at that video. Um, we did a full dip of, of the bottle, and in, in that case, um, I was showing you to sort of heat up the cap, uh, and then put the corks through straight, sorry, put the corks through straight through the wax and pull it off quickly. You'll get a nice clean break. Um, the concept is essentially the same here. Uh, you can go right through this if you want. You can. This should come off relatively easily if you want to pry it. Um, but I wouldn't go through that effort. I would just give it a quick twist, warm up that wax, straight through the corkscrew, and it'll come out quite easily. Um, and I guess while I have this in my hand, uh, this is the wine that we will be tasting next week. This is our 2017 Unsanctioned Series Pinot Noir. Um, a fairly... Uh, uh, low intervention style of winemaking for this. We used uh, um, wild fermentation, na native yeast fermentation, uh, low sulfur, um, didn't do a whole lot to it, uh, which is uh, great. It's got a, a nice sort of gain expression to it, lighter body, lighter expression of Pinot Noir. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing this with you guys next week. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. Hope you guys found this informative. Um, and go finish those uh, bottles of Omerta. Cheers. <laughs>